Most homicides are dark. This one was bizarre. What do you do when somebody invades every space of your life? In 2012, Dave Krupa, a newly single father of two, moved to Omaha to start over after separating from his longtime partner, Amy Flora. He looked online when he felt ready to start dating again. I didn't know how to venture back into the dating pool. I'd been out of it for a long time. The first person he met was Shanna Elizabeth Gallier, who goes by Liz. She was also a single parent with kids around the same age as Dave's. Liz loved taking selfies and sending them to her friends. She was sexy, she was bright and shiny, and she was very engaging. Dave says he was upfront with Liz when they met. He was dating several women and not looking for a commitment. Well, I was kind of going wild, just, you know, being free for the first time in a long time. Six months after meeting Liz, another single mom walks into the auto repair shop where he worked, 37-year-old Carrie Farver. When we looked at each other, there was a little spark. She had grown up in small town Macedonia, Iowa. She was extremely close with her mother, Nancy. She had a lot of friends. She was very gregarious. You noticed Carrie when she walked into her room. She had a laugh. She had a smile. You were drawn to her. She became pregnant with her son, Max, when she was 22, deciding to raise him alone when the relationship with Max's father didn't work out. She just doted on him all the time. Carrie had some mental health issues and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in her 20s. There was a couple of times when she just, she would stop taking the medication because she said, Mom, it just, I feel like I'm just numb. But by the fall of 2012, Carrie was in a good place. She landed a job as a computer programmer in Omaha. He was super excited and talked a lot about how that was going to be kind of a life changer for her and for Max. On her first date with Dave, Carrie says she too wants to keep things casual. I felt like I hit the jackpot with that. I, I couldn't have wrote it better. One slightly awkward thing, the night of Dave and Carrie's first date, Liz Goyer came by Dave's apartment to pick up some things that she'd left there. I walked Carrie out the front door, and she walked right by Liz, and they probably saw each other for six seconds. Carrie's office happened to be around the corner from Dave's apartment. Despite only dating for two weeks, she decided to stay with him while she was working on a big project instead of her making the hour commute from her home. Around 6.30 a.m. on November 13, 2012, Dave left for work early, kissing Carrie goodbye. It would be the last time he'd see her. Later that morning, he gets a message from Carrie. She texts me and says, uh, let's move in together which was very left field because we had already talked about that not happening. As soon as I can, I text her back and say, I'm not interested, I can't do that. And almost immediately I get a message back that says, fine, I hate you, I'm dating someone else, I don't want to see you anymore, uh, you know, go away, lots of profanity. I didn't know what to think. I was blown away. Later that day, Carrie's mom also got a strange text from her saying she was taking a new job in Kansas. So I texted her back and she would not call me and talk to me. Carrie's son had been staying with Nancy who became alarmed when Carrie didn't show up to take Max to a family wedding. That's when she reports Carrie missing. A lot of people thought she'd just gone off her meds and she was, you know, just went off the deep end and left. But I knew that that's not what happened. Meanwhile, Dave was still getting a barrage of angry messages from Carrie. They were bad, and they were just all about how bad of a person I am. Carrie's rage seems to be focused on his on-again, off-again ex-girlfriend, Liz, who he had dated before Carrie, which is confusing to Dave because uh, Carrie seemed to be so unaffected by her first interaction with Liz. Liz told Dave Carrie was harassing her, too. She wrote to Liz, if you don't keep your hands and lips off my man, I will hurt you. I would regularly receive 60 plus texts a day, 100 emails a day. It was not uncommon. Eventually, Carrie seemed to be flat out stalking Dave. On one specific occasion, I was uh, sitting in my lazy boy with my feet up, watching TV, trying to relax, and it's nighttime. 
and I get a text saying, I see you, you're sitting in your chair with your feet propped up wearing a blue shirt, and those things were true. Dave and Liz begin to call her Crazy Carrie. They get back together, united by their shared trauma. It was actually extremely common for us to be uh, hanging out, and both of our phones uh, would start blowing up with text messages and emails from Carrie. Nine months after Carrie is last seen, Liz calls Dave in a panic, saying her house has been burnt down. There's fire trucks all up and down the street, and there's firemen walking around, and there's hoses, and they're pouring water into place. Luckily, her children were not home, but many of her belongings were still there, including two dogs, a cat, and a snake, and they all were killed in this fire. From what I've seen so far, looking at the sign, this is, this is pretty obvious this is not intentionally set fire. The guy that I'm seeing, he has a girlfriend that he dated for two weeks, and she's been stalking me since November. I felt very bad for Liz because I felt like I brought this crazy person into her life. As weeks turn into months, Carrie's mom, Nancy, becomes increasingly worried. As her daughter fails to show up for the holidays, Max's birthday, and her father, Dennis's funeral. I had a very, very, very vivid dream that Dennis had come to me, and he said, Nancy, don't worry about her. She's with me. Max decides to reach out to his mom over Facebook. All it said was hi, and she immediately wrote him back, hey, little man, how are you? He asked her to answer three questions to prove that it was really her, and she never responded to that message. Then Carrie posts on Facebook, I've answered enough questions to prove myself. I'm not missing, I just don't want to come home right now. And one of the things about these text messages, they don't look like they're written by Carrie. They're filled with spelling errors and grammatical errors. And her mother said Carrie never would have sent messages like that. By the spring of 2015, the missing person case Carrie's mom had filed two and a half years earlier had gone cold. Detectives Ryan Avis and Jim Doty had heard about the case around the office and volunteered to work on it. They examined the case file with a fresh perspective. Doty investigating as though Carrie was dead and Abe is trying to prove she was alive. Carrie's checking account had no activity. It's not normal for adults to just up and leave and literally spend no money, no one's seen them. It just, just didn't make sense. The key to the case at this point is figuring out if Carrie is not alive, who has been actually sending these messages to Dave and to Liz. Detective Doty focuses on Liz Gallier. All of a sudden, she's this focus of harassment. Her name was all over all the reports. During the investigation of her harassment claim against Carrie, Liz had allowed police to download the contents of her phone. Avis and Doty reviewed those files and found a photo of Carrie's car. We looked at the metadata of that photo, and it was taken about a month before police even recovered her vehicle. So somehow Liz knew where Carrie's vehicle was before law enforcement even did. Another thing we found on the phone download, there were six calls that were made to Carrie's residence. Uh, it was using the star six seven prefix to disguise the number. And so Liz was calling Carrie uh, six times. We found an email that Carrie had sent to Dave Krupa. It consisted of a picture of a woman who was tied up. We found that picture of that bound woman in Liz's phone and the metadata showed it was taken from Liz's phone. They realized that Liz had put duct tape on her own mouth, had tied up her own hands, and crawled into the trunk of a car. Coming up. All of the investigating they had done was leading them to the idea that Carrie Farber was dead, and Liz had been impersonating her this entire time. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.